That was very warm, thank you so much. Um, welcome to the early morning, creative morning, mini edition of Back Fence PDX. And just one more time, how are you guys doing this morning? <laughs> awesome, um, I have brought with me today three fabulous storytellers who will all be telling stories, as Celie said, based on the theme, money. So they'll be talking about how um, money affects both personal choices that they make and how it affects the way that they view themselves. So essentially, they're gonna be tearing open their hearts and ripping open their guts for our entertainment pleasure this morning, which is pretty awesome. Um, and at Backfence PDX, we have a few rules about stories. First of all, they are true and they are personal stories. They are told without notes and they are told unscripted. And as though that were not risky enough, they will also be sharing very personal details with you this morning that they have never ever shared publicly. Right? Can we get a ooh? Yeah, let's, let's hear that early in the morning, ooh. Nice, um, okay, and so also the story's gonna be about 10 minutes long and to help them keep track of time, when there's about two minutes left in their story, they'll hear this. Oh, pretty, okay. And when there's about one minute left in their story, you'll hear this. <laughs> wow, it's really hard not to resist making a morning wood joke there, but um, so I did, I did it, I did it, I said it. There was some wood on the xylophone, what can I say? Um, and so I think that that's really all we need to know to bring up our first storyteller. You guys wanna hear our first storyteller? Yeah. Um, so I asked each storyteller to answer these two questions. One, what have you spent too much money on in your life? And the second one, what have you not spent enough money on in your life? And our first storyteller said he has spent too much money on weed in his life and not enough money on grow lights. <laughs> so I think we can get a sense that he might be a very pragmatic person. Um, please, uh, again, give a very warm welcome to our very first storyteller of the morning, Mr. Dave Jarecki. Good morning, everyone. Let me know if uh, this is sounding okay. So in the year 2000, when I was 24 years old, I was desperate to find what, I would, uh, what you can call your first real job. I'd been out of school for two years, and I studied English with a, um, an intent to be a writer. And so the jobs that I had in, the, in those two years were as follows. Uh, Full-time janitor, which I, was, I really excelled at a uh, part-time morning convention banquet setup person. I, didn't, I wasn't too good at that. Um, and then a copy editor, which was really close to being a writer, but not. <laughs> and then I was a part-time janitor. So I'd basically gone full circle, and I had also uh, discovered that I was going nowhere. So I, uh, that, this sort of emphasis put me in the, put my nose in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel one Sunday morning, where I was living with my girlfriend, and I came across a classified ad that read as follows, looking for a creative writer to join our staff of crazy people, which it sounded like it was speaking right to me. It didn't, say, it didn't say what it was or where it was that I'd possibly be working, but I got very excited about this, and I really saw that this was my opportunity to join the, uh, the workforce as a writer, so I sent in my, my resume, which was about this big, and, um, you know, I had my three little clips that I had written for, you know, the RAG in central Pennsylvania where I'd gone to school. 
Uh, the the uh, the thing that I did for the newsletter at the restaurant where I was a janitor. So I, I really didn't have much of a portfolio to <laughs> to send, but <clears throat> you know I had a lot of desire. And um, and sure enough, I got a phone call to come in for an interview. And when I showed up, it was at an ad agency. And I had never I'd taken one advertising class when I was a freshman because there was a lot of hot sophomore girls in it, and I thought that was like a good way to possibly meet somebody. And so um, I go to the interview and. I guess I didn't bomb the interview. I wore like the one nice shirt that I own and the one tie that I owned. And the next day I get a phone call from the creative director and uh, sure enough, I, he's offered me the job. And I'm very excited about this possibility. And um, so we, we're, we're talking on the phone and I, I, it sounds like he's at a, uh, a drive through for Burger King or something like that. <laughs> so I'm obviously, my time is very short and I say, well, you know, we didn't really talk about salary. And um, and I, again, I'm coming from being a janitor, I'm making about $7 an hour, so he says, well, what's, what's a fair range to you? And I, uh, I think, I'm like, well, what's the biggest amount of money I could ask for right now? Uh, I guess there's two schools of thought. You either ask high and you let them whittle you down or you blowball yourself. And so I, I said, well, you know, what feels like a fair range for a first-time writer is twenty to $25,000, which was like a shit ton of money for me, making $7 an hour. And, um, and I'm thinking that he's going to like be, I'm, I'm thinking that the professional thing to do is to come right in the middle and offer me the middle. So he says, well, I'll tell you what we'll do, Dave. Here's one of two possibilities. One is uh, we'll start you off at 22.5 and then you'll, you won't get a raise for a year. Or, or, carrot dangling, we'll start you off at 20 and then we'll add in 90 days if you're going gangbusters, his words, not mine, <laughs> we'll bump you up to 25. And so being the shrewd negotiator that I was, I said, that sounds like a great idea, so let's start at 20. So I, I pretty much sealed my fate of, uh, with this really low figure, thinking that it was still a lot of money. And um, so I show up, and, and, but there was so much more to it that got me excited in those first 90 or 100, 120 days before the actual review came. As, um, you know, I had my own office, which... Strange as it was, the office had no windows. It was just a, uh, a cubby that, as they told me, had actually been a converted janitor's closet. <laughs> which I thought was great because I was a converted janitor. So now, I, I was like right at home in this converted janitor's closet with no windows. It had three white walls and the fourth wall had a black door and the black door had a glass panel. And that was my window. And I got to look out into the industrial carpet and the, a couple, like the legs I would walk by now and again. Um, but I, I was proud of this, and I had a business card, and I remember the day that, the pride that I, like, Dave Jarecki, copywriter, and uh, sent that business card home to my dad. I was like, see, you know, I was the first person in my family to graduate from college, so it made sense that I would have a business card, and I'd be able to send that to my dad someday. And, um, and I spent the first, like, 90 days, like I said, really doing my best to go gangbusters in my closet, and... Um, and I'm also looking around, and, and I can't wear the same houndstooth tie every day because it's really, I only own like one good tie and one really kind of bad tie. So you know, I started asking around, and everyone's dressed a lot nicer than I am. So I'm like, I need to, I want to embody, I want to, what is this identity of copywriter? So I start, um, all the graphic designers, they know all these brands that I've never heard of, like Kenneth Cole and, and uh, Hilfiger and um, Jeffrey Bean and uh, the creative director wears Ralph Lauren. And I'm like, I'm going to go buy some of this stuff that I can't really afford making $20,000 an hour, but I, I really want to fit in. So, you know, I go out and I, one weekend I spend $70 and I come home with like two ties and a belt. And I'm like, all right, now I'm gonna, um, this is going to really help me during the next week. And then the next week I go out and I buy, I spend $80 and I'm, I got one pair of pants and like a pair of socks. And, but I, I'm feeling really good about my wardrobe. And I have, I'm, I'm not really too invested in anything that I'm writing, but, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to get into being a copywriter. And so the, uh, the review, the, the, the period of the review kind of comes, and then the review doesn't come, and then I start, I don't really know how to ask for, hey, is it, can I have my review? And, um, and so that about 120, 130 days, it's time for my review. So I go into uh, the creative director's office, and I just want to describe what I, what I walk into. So the creative director is a, uh, he's this really pent up, um, type A closeted gay Republican who really like all those things together just like was always kind of mind blowing. Had this like in his, he kind of looked like Rob, so picture, picture that guy, but picture Robin Williams playing that guy, like a really <laughs> punched up Robin Williams. 
with a hairline that like starts here, and he's got this like bouffant like poof thing. And um, so that's the creative director, and, uh, and he's sitting at this desk and all, all Ralph Lauren out. And then opposite him is the owner of the company who is, he kind of looks like a Coca-Cola panda bear, or a polar bear. But he's like a bipolar bear because he's like, <laughs> he's like manic depressive and he's in a manic phase right now. So he's actually kind of happy. And he's like sitting there, he's got like a little drool coming out because he self-medicates. Uh, and his, his form of self-medication was a six pack of butt ice and a handful of whatever pills he had laying around. But, you know, like I said, he was in a manic phase. So he was, he was actually not that bad to be around. So I come in and, and I say, uh, okay, I sit down for my review and I, I have all my, you know, my ducks lined up that I want to talk about. And, and the review lasts a minute and it goes like this. Um, Dave, you're doing a great job and we're going to change your title. No longer are you going to be called copywriter, you're now the lead writer. Which is great, except I'm the only writer in the place, so... <laughs> they could have called me anything they wanted to. It wasn't going to change the fact that I'm still the person who's writing everything. The second part of the uh, conversation says, Oh, by the way, we're going to put the whole art department on a salary freeze. And thank you. I got to thank you. And I walked out. And, um, and so in that, and it took like 30 seconds for that all to process that I was essentially stuck at this low figure, which um, I had put myself into that situation. And um, I had spent a bunch of stuff that I couldn't really afford. I had been imagining that this other $5,000 was just going to rain down on me like in, in a check and all these things would be cleared and I would be able to pay my school loans and I would be able to buy an engagement ring for my girlfriend and, and just things like that. And so I walked back to my office all, like 15 seconds to get across the hallway and in, that, in those 15 seconds I suddenly just stopped giving a shit about everything. And, um, and then in the next like three, four months, I kind of, um, I stripped away all that, that new identity that I was in trying to inform myself with, with my Kenneth Cole and, and whatnot. And I went back to um, these, these parts of me that had been latent or kind of put aside this sort of hippie, if, or, but it was kind of more like an angry hippie. <laughs> started to like, started to like manifest itself out of me because um, not only was my salary being truncated, but I also felt like my creativity was being truncated. And so uh, I went about, in this really um, methodical way, redecorating my closet. So it's going from janitor's closet to copywriter's office, and now I'm like actually going backwards in time, and I'm decorating it like a dorm room. So. <laughs> Um, so gone are the white walls, so on a daily basis I'm bringing in like, I find my old black light posters that I've kind of like had rolled up in my closet at home and now they're on my walls and, and I find, uh, you know, I have this awesome Grateful Dead picture and that goes up on the wall in a frame and then this Dylan cover from, a, you know, from, his, from his book that he wrote back in the 60s goes up on the wall and, and then, um, then people start giving me things because they're seeing like, oh this guy looks like he's kind of, you know, I don't know, he's either losing it or he's coming out of something. So I want to encourage this in some way. So then, like, <clears throat> this, guy, this guy from the back room gives me a lava lamp that had been, like, his, his like, old girlfriend's. And then this, uh, this other girl brings me these hippie beads. He's like, oh, you got to hang these in your door. And then you can leave your door open all the time. And, um, and so then, so now, and then, and then, um, then I noticed that for those three or four months when I was just the, the Kenneth Cole copywriter, no one looked at me. Like people just, you know, other than the artists, the, the graphic designers, the salespeople never even paid any mind to me. And now all of a sudden people are coming, they're like, they're like slowly trickling into my office for no apparent reason. And they're sitting down and they start telling me things about their lives. And um, like this one guy starts telling me that he was a huge David Byrne fan and like doesn't fish play David Byrne songs and hey, maybe we could be buds. And then like someone else tells me like, Oh, uh, I have only cried twice in my adult life, and one, and and he starts crying while he's telling me this, and then the the owner, the 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 bipolar bear owner, he starts hanging out in my office because he's going through a divorce, and um, and he's he's dating a new, this new age girl from Cleveland, which I didn't know they exist in Cleveland, but he and the new age girl are going to these like weekend new age retreats, and then he's like. At uh, 3 o'clock every day, he comes into my office, he lays down on the floor, he tells me to burn incense and put on Dark Side of the Moon. And, <laughs> and I'm just like, and so everyone is like, so all these people are like gravitating toward me as this hippie's coming out, except the creative director who hates me now. 
So he comes in my office and he's, he doesn't know how to navigate the beads. And he's like, you know, he's all, he, and, he sta- and he gets nervous and he, he does this a lot. With like, like I, it was like this nervous thing that he did. Like he'd be talking to me and he'd be doing this. And so, so I think people are really, everyone is kind of like feeling the, the pinch of whatever kind of salary freeze is going on. And, and I'm kind of, I'm the only person in the office who's kind of giving it back to the creative director. Um, you know, just with, he's, because he's this huge, big Republican, I have all these anti-George W. Bush things all over the place, and I'm like slipping him in his office. So I'm, I'm just kind of being a dick, really, because like I have no other, I have no other ammunition other than just to be a dick. And so, um, and everything lasts, you know, things are going kind of jovially, and, I, and I'm realizing that um, not only am I like single-handedly having, I'm helping to bring the productivity of this office down, but I myself have no work, and um, which doesn't really matter until about late that summer, there's actually a recession going on, and we have our clients are starting to pull work off the table, and uh, the, the owner is no longer hanging out in my office, he's kind of swung back to depressive, and he makes us, uh, we have to start filling out timesheets for where we're spending our hours. Um, um, uh, for the, we have to start filling our our billable hours, and I have like, I do it one week, and I'm like, I have like 14 billable hours this week. I've been here for 40 hours. I don't know what I did with the other 26 hours. And it actually gets worse and worse as the weeks go on. And and then 9-11 hits, which I I just mentioned that because it actually did have an effect on, um, it had an effect that all these clients had pulled away. Now they've completely stopped the presses, and I am in there and I'm wearing like, you know, I've been wearing these Birkenstocks for when I started the hippie thing. These old Birkenstocks came out. I'm in there in my Birkenstocks and I'm, I'm trying to make stuff up and I'm down to like three billable hours a week and I form a hemorrhoid, which is like, this, it's like sitting on a cactus for like eight hours a day. And um, so I'm in there like trying not to like, I'm like trying to like, I'm doing this and I, I, have, like, I'm, I have like fake work in front of me and the owner's depressive and... Uh, someone, our, a salesperson gets fired, and then another kind of project manager quits, and so all this, so there's all this, like, I think there's all this money, and, um, but I'm still on a salary freeze, so I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm, I'm still, like, goading the owner, but it's becoming a little more adamant, and now I'm sort of, I, I switch over, and now the angry hippie really gets a little angrier, and I'm starting to preach, like, workers' rights, and I'm reading Marx out in public, and so, <laughs> um, we're, so finally, October comes around, we're in a big creative meeting, and I'm sitting there, and I, I'm, I'm, being like, I'm being a little better because I realize that I don't want to get fired, no matter how much I'm really not liking there or, or getting any money. So and I'm sitting, and I got my Birkenstocks on, and I'm taking notes, and the creative director is yapping, and he looks over at me, and he sees my Birkenstocks, and he says, you can't wear those anymore. And, to which, and so the room is filled with people, and I look at him and I say, well, that's a stupid thing to say. Don't, don't you think that's stupid? I mean, we're, we're in a creative meeting here. I think that's stupid. And I just kept saying that, and, and that was kind of the moment that the water started to come out of the, the dike. And uh, I go across to my closet, and, uh, and I get summoned back into his office. And I walk in, and it's the exact same scene from my review, except now the owner is depressive and angry, and the creative director is angry, and, um, and they say, uh, well, Dave, we're not sure we could validate your salary anymore. The $20,000 salary that I'd been, uh, you know, chumming away at since last, last November. And I kind of flip out, because at this point, the dam is now busted, um, and that's it. I am escorted out of the building about an hour later by the graphic designers. And... Um, <laughs> with all my hippie stuff in my shoe boxes. But I just want to add uh, a couple things happened shortly thereafter. One, uh, I got a contract gig and was able to afford my, uh, my, the wedding ring for my wife, my, my soon-to-be wife. My hemorrhoid went away miraculously the next day. And um, <laughs> the graphic designers sent out a job with a fat-ass typo in the middle of it that cost the company $5,000, which validated at least one quarter of my salary. Thank you. <laughs> Keep it going for Dave Jarecki. Oh, we've all been in that job, haven't we? Um, All right, maybe you're in it now, I don't know. Um, (laughs) 
Our next storyteller answered the question, um, what do I wish I have spent more money on? And she said, um, a certified tax accountant <laughs> and dental floss, adding to that. And um, which, uh, those are the things she, spent, which she had spent more money on. And the thing that she had wishes she had spent less money on um, were Dan Fogelberg eight tracks and memorabilia. Uh, please welcome to the stage our next storyteller, Molly Norton. So, so it's the, uh, the spring of 2006, and um, it's a early, late morning, early afternoon, and I, I wake up and I look around, and I'm in a um, kind of scary, spooky warehouse with a big bathtub next to me, and um, I'm somewhere in the middle of downtown Los Angeles, where I am exactly, I, 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 don't, I don't really know exactly. Um, but it occurs to me at that point, a couple things occur to me. Um, number one, I haven't seen The Price is Right since I was in elementary school. And uh, number two is I'm not feeling very well. So, um, so just as a side note, the event that I'd gone to the night before, I was under the impression, I'd kind of build it in my mind as being a casual barbecue wine tasting with, with new friends, but ended up involving costumes, um, two Amber Crombie and Fitch models, uh, said bathtub, and a man on the run. So, um, which is a whole nother back then story entirely. Um, so, so anyway, I'm there in Los Angeles because I'm supposed to meet up with some friends of mine for a birthday celebration, and uh, it's a birthday celebration, and the birthday girl really, really, really wanted to get on The Price is Right. And um, just to give a little backstory on this group of friends, they're very, um, very wickedly bright, you know, very intelligent, um, very uh, tall, attractive, uh, very successful. They all had MBAs from Stanford, um, so a very wickedly bright group of people, always very um, in Intimidating. I was always very intimidated by them, and um, and I always thought of myself as being the dumb one. In fact, if this were a, an episode of Friends, um, I would be playing Joey. So, um, so, so then it occurs to me that someone could actually get on the Prices Right, and that someone could be me. And I needed to learn how to play the Prices Right, and I needed to learn how to play it really, really fast. So I go to my friend's house where I'm staying, and um, and uh, I pull out the laptop, and I start. I, I go through the laptop, or I, I start cruising for uh, Prices Right, um, Prices Right uh, gaming and strategy type of stuff. And by golly, I hit the jackpot. There's someone who'd actually writ, written their Cal um, dissertation, statistics dissertation, on Prices Right gaming and strategy. So boom. I am, I am in it. I am in it. And, um, so, and I don't have a whole lot of time because I've got to be up the next morning really, really early to get to the Price is Right studios to meet my friends. And so I tuck into this and, um, and I'm, I'm kind of I'm going, 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 going. And uh, the friend that I'm staying with finally looks at me and says, you know what, you're not going to get on the Price is Right, number one. And number two, you kind of need to get a life. So I close up the laptop, but, n but not without remembering the, um, the top four uh, rules of Price is Right Club. So the top four rules. Um, rule number one, they're going to interview you, and you need to be totally over the top. Number two, you can't look like you're too smart. Um, number three, if you get on the Price is Right, um, or if you, if you get called down, you need to take the podium that's furthest on the left, um, because that puts you in prime bidding position, and you can kind of surf off other people's bids. Uh, number four, if you get to the wheel, always spin again on anything under 65. All right, okay, so we got it, boom. So I go to sleep, I go to sleep, and, uh, and, I, and I wake up, and it's three o'clock in the morning. You have to get there very, very early if you wanna get on the prices right. So it's three o'clock in the morning, and I, I drive to the studio, and I meet up with my friends, and to make a long story short, we wait in many lines for many hours, and uh, finally, we make it in, and we know that we're gonna be part of the studio audience. Woo! So we get in, so we're part of the studio audience, and um, they have us in this holding area, because then the next step is, is that they're going to be uh, interviewing us. So they bring us in in groups of five, and my friends are all, you know, very, very, very bright and very eloquent, and, uh, and I'm remembering the top two rules of Price is Right. Rule number one, that's right, you have, 
That's the second one. Okay, the first one is you have to be totally over the top. And number two, don't look too smart. Boom. All right. Hi. <laughs> Hi. My name is Molly. My name is Molly. Um, I'm, I'm from San Francisco, California. I work in human resources, and I love Bob. I love Bob. I watch the prices read all the, right, right, all the time, and, um, and uh, I have this really goofy frog joke that I really want to tell him. And uh, at that point, the auditor kind of looks up and says, well, Molly, maybe you, you will get to tell your frog joke. So um, I was like, oh, okay. So, uh, so then they shuttle us into the studio audience. The lights come up. Bob comes out. He gives his spiel. And uh, next thing I know, there's a big sign with my name on it. And I hear, Molly Norton, come on down. And, you know, I'm jumping up and down like I'm really excited. I'm really excited. I'm really excited. But inside, I'm absolutely terrified. I am panicked because my friend told me that I wasn't going to get on the prices right. And I didn't finish the dissertation. So, um, um, and, uh, and, and uh, I forgot to mention that my friends, my group of friends, they're pretty much everything that, that, that you know, that I am, um, that I am not. I mean, I'm, I'm divorced at the time. I'm living in a 300 square foot studio. I have a bachelor's of fine arts in, in theater and writing from Texas Tech University. Get your guns up. And um, so... So I'm, 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 I'm pretty panicked, I'm, I'm pretty panicked, but um, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about the next rule of Price is Right Club. The next rule of Price is Right Club. I'm, I'm going down, I'm going through the audience, which podium do I take? Left. I take the podium furthest left. I'm in prime bidding position. And, uh, and, and so the first item comes up, and I manage to give a ridiculously low bid on not one, but two sets of really high-end ski equipment. So, so I lose the first one. Next, they bring up a diamond-encrusted uh, globe paperweight, about so big, that not only tells the time, but the temperature and the amount of moisture in the air. And... I give my bid, and uh, it's a solid bid. I bid about $500, and it has an actual retail price of $1,295. I win the globe, and I am up on stage. And, woo, yes, thank you. So, so um, I get up on stage. The lights are very bright. People are screaming, and, uh, and Bob is, you know, I've been on stage at that point hundreds of times in my life, but I'd never experienced anything like this. And I'm not only in, in a haze, I'm in a wake up in downtown Los Angeles, in a, in a warehouse where you don't know where you are, next to a bathtub kind of a haze. And, um, and he's explaining the rules to the game, and I'm not, I'm not quite listening. And, um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to win a hot tub. I'm there to win a hot tub. What I will do with a hot tub in a 300 square foot studio, I, I, I have, I, have no, I have no idea, I have no idea, but I figure that I will figure it out. And, um, and I, I set, so the bell rings, I set my bid, I look out into the audience because my friends, being the very strategic MBAs that they are, had developed a set of complex hand signals to <laughs> signal to me whether I needed to bid up or bid down. So it was like this or like this. And I, and I, I look out into the audience and they're going like this. And, and, and I sit there and I, I, I contemplate it for a very long time. I've got the, the, the deer in the headlights going. And I'm thinking, Fuck, we didn't talk about this. We didn't talk about this. Next thing I know, the buzzer buzzes. Rawr! And Bob says, oh, Molly, that's not the way we play the game. And only in my mind and in, in my memory, it was more like something that was directed by David Lynch. It was like, oh, Molly. That's not the way we play the game. Game, 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 game. Cha, 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 cha. And so, but I do find out that I have a chance to go to the wheel. So, so I still have a chance to redeem myself. So I go to the wheel, and the wheel is very heavy, and I'm short, and I, and I, and I grab it, and I, and I pull it down, and it lands on 60. Do I stay or do I spin again? Spin again. I spin again. It hits 25, 85. I have won the wheel. Yes. And um, apparently this means that, I, so I, I thought I was done and I could leave and I could leave with my head high, but no, it meant that I was going to something called the Showcase Showdown. 
oh my God, I'm going to the Showcase Showdown, and I, I didn't remember how that was played. And I, I could not remember anything about the Showcase Showdown. And while I'm waiting to get on stage for the Showcase Showdown, they have me in this holding area where I'm surrounded by retired people. And I'm thinking that, oh, they're going to think this is really funny and charming, and you know, isn't this cute? But no, they are out for blood. Um, there, one person looks at me and says, so have you never watched The Price is Right, Molly? And another says, so what, what happened to you in that hot tub round? And I'm like, wow, so not only am I thinking about my friends that are rolling their eyes thinking, why did Joey make it on The Price is Right? Now I've got middle America, retired middle America that's you know, kind of you know, on my back thinking I'm a big dumbass. And, um, and so, um, so I'm like, and then it occurs to me that there are people that wait all of their lives to get on game shows like all of their lives, that this is their golden ticket to retirement, this is their nest egg, and I needed to like get serious about this, and I needed to put my game face on, and I needed, I needed to get serious. So I go up on stage, and, uh, and you know, I'm, 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 I'm really, really, really nervous. Um, the Barker's Beauties come out, they're wearing bikinis, one's on a treadmill, um, showing me a treadmill, the other one is showing me this totally unattractive bedroom set. Um, <laughs> And then the, uh, the piece de resistance was the pop-up camper trailer that, that hitched behind the truck that I did not own. And I'm looking at all of this and I'm thinking, you know, all of this, none of this fits into my world. This is not part of my world and I'm going to have to pay a lot of taxes on it. And uh, anyway, so, I, um, so I'm remembering the Price is Right strategy. Um, I, I'm, some, some of the retired people filled me in on, on how, to play, um, how to play the uh, showcase showdown. I give a solid bid, but the person uh, I was competing against a bid solider. And so she, she won the whole thing, and I end up going back to San Francisco, but with nothing but my little diamond-encrusted globe paperweight. And I get back to San Francisco, and, uh, and I find out that I owe $400 in taxes on my paperweight, and, uh, which a friend of mine said she found later at a bargain basement, Kohl's bargain basement sale for 99 um, I'm talking to my mother, and she says, you know, it was, it was really neat seeing you on The Price is Right. And I was like, you know, and, I'm, and my mother's a very pragmatic person. And I said, yeah, Mom, wasn't it great that I didn't win all that stuff? I mean, it was ugly, and where was I going to put it in my studio, and I would have had to pay taxes on it. And my mother says, your father really wanted that trailer. <laughs> so... The silver lining in all of this is right before I left for Los Angeles, I was corresponding online through a popular dating service with a, with a gentleman. And uh, I really liked his profile because he said that he didn't play games unless they were on a board or with a deck of cards. And he liked my profile, he said, because he thought my writing was smart and funny. And uh, he also knew that I wasn't materialistic because I didn't care about winning anything on The Price is Right. And two years later, I married him. <laughs> Thanks. All right, your final storyteller this morning telling a story based on the theme money um, says that he wishes he had spent less money on uh, really crappy 90s rock CDs that he doesn't listen to anymore. And he wishes he had spent more money on good bourbon rather than bad bourbon. Uh, please welcome to the stage our final storyteller, Jeff Hardison. So I think uh, John Raymond said, uh, you should never talk about being happy uh, because maybe the gods will smite you and you'll get hit by a lightning bolt when you walk out. I'm kind of hesitant to say this then, but I've never been happier in my life than I am now. I've got a job where I get to be very creative. You know, we work for, do mobile apps for museums and I have enough time left over where I can you know, work on my own projects like uh, being in a band or doing things like this. But it wasn't always that way. When I was 19, um, I found, my, found myself very torn into what I needed to do with my life. I had been jumping around from major to major in college, and I'd kind of settled on uh, creative writing. But it was kind of difficult with the professor. Um, he would do really weird things. He, he walked in one day, and he like pulled off his scarf and threw down his textbook, and he turned to us and he said, Kids, once you start to 
do art. Once you start to write, once you start to paint, once you start to play in a band, you've been bitten by that bug. And you can't, you can't abandon it. It is with you with, for life. And the only way that maybe you could abandon it is become an alcoholic and try to drink yourself to death. And we were like, whoa, what a way to start the class. But, you know, for months, this started to really, you know, it started to haunt me. Because I knew I was in this position where what I loved to do more than anything was write and play drums and theater. But I was worried about taking that path. I was worried about, you know, maybe being a failed artist, maybe um, not being able to make a living, you know, as I got older. And I hadn't grown up with much money, so that was a big fear of mine. But on the other end, you know, I didn't want to necessarily go into a very corporate office job. I couldn't picture myself there either. Um, you know, here in Portland, you know, your accountant is like an abandoned night. But back in the South, it's not like that. The lines are, you know, it, it's very down the middle, and you're either in business or you're not. And I kind of felt torn between these two choices, and I felt like I had to make a choice or another. So I started to, you know, ask people what I should do. And part of the problem was that, you know, I grew up around artists. My brother, um, he was a concert promoter, and um, he always had artists around. And, and a few of them, you know, their careers have taken off. You've probably heard of some of them. But many of them were hitting about age 35 or 40, and they started to kind of worry. One guy in particular, his name was Greg. And Greg, um, he had been in kind of a popular band in the early 90s. It was kind of like this party funk band um, along the lines of the Spin Doctors, but worse. <laughs> and his band kind of went out of style, and he couldn't book gigs anymore. Um, the kind of the music that was taken over was the stuff in the later 90s, like kind of the Radiohead stuff or, you know, for you record collectors out there like Slint and so forth. And no one wanted him playing. Um, and it started to really bum him out, and he would get pissed off. He worked at a coffee shop during the day, and he started actually ripping the posters down of, like, all the young bands coming up. And he started being really rude to all the customers, and finally they fired him. They're like, you're just too bitter, man. And he was really pissed off about it because they hired some, like, young guy, and he thought it was ageism. And his girlfriend, she ended up leaving him over the whole thing. Um, she ended up started dating a, an advertising graphic designer, and Greg bitched that it was because the guy dressed just like him in the same thrift store clothes but made more money. And, you know, I was like, I don't want to be like Greg. I don't want to be hitting like, age 35, you know, I'm 36 now, and feeling like, you know, I hadn't learned anything else to fall back on. I'm not good with my hands, so I couldn't do anything like that. I would have to have, like, some type of side career. And I didn't want to be bitter, and I didn't want to be in anybody's way. And it was just, I was torn. What do I do? I, this artistic path, I don't really have a good model for that. Um, career path, I don't really have a good model for that. And so I started talking to my brother about it. He's like, why don't you do like me? Why don't you um, work in the business of art? And, you know, I'm a concert promoter, and it's fun. I still get to be around art. And I thought, you know, maybe there's something to that. So I started looking at jobs along those lines, like maybe I could go work for a record label, or maybe I could go work for a publisher. And I ended up finding that a local zine had an internship, and it was the summertime, it was before my junior year, and this zine, um, you know, they were hiring an intern, I got the job, and when I arrived, it wasn't exactly what I expected. Um, I pictured kind of like a sitting around on beanbags, like listening to music, putting the vinyl on the turntable, you know, maybe smoking some weed. Um, I, I didn't realize that this zine was actually trying to take it to the next level. They were kind of like, you know, they were a little bit like a step below like the Portland Mercury, but with like less exclamation points. <laughs> and they were considered sellouts though in Louisville, Kentucky, because you know they weren't they were no longer like stapled together scenes, making it at Kinko's and they like added color to it, which was like a real sellout maneuver, I guess. And they started to uh, take advertising. And the founders of the zine, they were in a they were in a situation where they were turning 35 and 40 and they wanted to try to make this scene, you know, help pay the rent. And I just wasn't comfortable in the situation. I found that their whole uh, mission was to basically make fun of every type of um, musician that came through, <laughs> that came through um, and set their CDs in. And we had to make fun of every restaurant that came through. And we had to make fun of um, all the coffee shops in town. And the whole thing was just a huge bummer. Okay, and I know that sounds kind of weird, you know, out here we're we're much more like kind of up with people. But in the, in Louisville, everybody's Everybody's a dick in Louisville, Kentucky. I mean, like, Hunter S. Thompson, dick. Muhammad Ali, dick, you know. 
Um, George Clooney, dick. Tom Cruise, dick. You know, all those people are from Kentucky. And I, that's, that was the way it was there. And it wasn't for me. I was 19 years old. I was idealistic. You know, I wrote short stories, not like takedown pieces. And to, to top it off, we had a competitor in town. This competitor, it was Much Cooler magazine. And their zine was all about, um, it was called Kendrick, or I mean, it was called Kermit the Cat Fan Club Newsletter. Okay? It was about the guy's cat, and the cat wrote reviews <laughs> about all the music. It was all very positive. And each month, it was like a different pose of the cat on the cover, kind of like Oprah Winfrey's magazine. <laughs> and you know, honestly, I don't know if there was even like a fan club or if there was a cat that was talking, but <laughs> this magazine was really popular. And I was like, I got to go up against this. I got to go up against a cat that talks and it's like cool and has good taste. <laughs> and it just didn't seem fair. It seemed like, like okay, the artist path isn't working for me. The, the middle ground, like the business of art, isn't working for me. And I was really bummed out. And this guy that would always hang around the place named Kendrick um, kind of took notice and said, hey, let's talk. I've noticed that you don't seem like you're fitting in really well. And, you know, um, let, let's talk through it. And Kendrick, as it turned out, was a friend of the, the magazine's owners, and he was a lawyer, okay? And um, he was kind of skinny and tall, and he always wore a suit every day because he'd be coming from his law practice, and he had like a Porsche out front and had like a mustache, and it didn't seem like the kind of guy that I should be, you know, talking to. I kind of looked like an undercover cop. <laughs> and I said, all right, fine, I'll just listen to you. Like, I, I have no hope. And he said, look, I, when I was your age, um, I wanted to be a poet, right? I was in college, but I thought... There's nobody that, you know, I can't make any living off poetry, you know? And I thought, I don't want to, like, saddle my family with this debt from college, so I'm going to go get a job that pays. And he became a lawyer. And I thought, oh, I can't become a lawyer. He's going to tell me that I, not, I need to become a lawyer and I become, like, a trial lawyer. And I just could not, that extreme was not an option for me. Um, but as I started to talk to him over the weeks and he started kind of coaching me, he became like a mentor, and I started to get really close to him. And he said, you know, you could always make art your plan A if it takes off, you know, but at least you have something to fall back on. And it, it started to make sense, you know, kind of have a plan A, plan B. And, you know, I, I, I started to think about this. And I was getting ready to go back to college. The internship was about to end and Kendrick stopped coming around. And I was like, what's happening to Kendrick? And I kind of forgot about it. And towards the very end, I said, hey, I want to say goodbye to Kendrick. And um, they're like, yeah, he's not coming around. I was, and they, everybody was being really weird about it. And a couple of nights later, it was like the last night, I went out and had some drinks at the bar, and I saw the, the editor-in-chief's uh, girlfriend there. And she was really drunk, and she's like, yeah, you need to stop asking about Kendrick. And I was like, why? She's like, he's, he's not doing so well. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, he's, he's really sick. I was like, what do you mean? She's dying. I was like, what do you mean he's dying? I started thinking back. He was kind of like thin, and I thought, what, do you, what, what does he have? She's like, he's got AIDS. And I was like, well, you can't have AIDS. Kendrick has it all figured out. Like, he said he, had, he loved his life. He got to do his poetry on the side. Why? What happened to him? He's gotten money. Like, you can buy drugs now that will prolong his life. And he's like, he's not, he's ignored it forever, and he's just, it's over. Just stop bringing it up, okay? He's in a hospice, and he's not got long to live. And I said, what happened? How did he get AIDS? And like, I don't, look, he never was quite happy with his life. He never wanted to really be a lawyer. He always regretted not being a poet. And instead of actually going home at night after the law job and writing, he would go out and get drunk every night. And he'd go to like be around artists. He'd go to like the punk bars and they thought he was like this stupid yuppie. And so he'd buy them all drinks. He'd give them coke. He'd give them pills. He was sleeping with like a different person every night for like 20 years. And somewhere along the way he got AIDS and he gave it to his wife later. And he's got like a week to live. And just shut up about it, okay? And it just floored me. You know, I was like, I'd grown close to this guy and like months went by and I grieved. Everybody else grieved and years went by and I thought like my only two models that I've ever had for what I should do for with my life is one, a guy who tried art and then regretted it. Another guy who tried to suppress his artistic drive and regretted it. And what do you do with that? And it was actually art that saved me. When I think about it, my favorite artworks, my favorite books, my favorite films are those that don't try to make a choice. They don't ever say somebody's completely good or completely bad. They show that people are a mixture and that there's many ways to live your life. And that's the, it's the raising up of those questions and keeping this to suspend it is what I think is beautiful. 
and never really choosing one way or the other. And it's a daily negotiation between what you should do. Should you be an artist? Should you, you know, have a career? Should you mix the two together? But it's that daily negotiation that I think makes for great art and it makes for a great life. Keep it going for Jeff Hardison and all three of our storytellers. Um, thank you so much, Celie, for inviting us to be here this morning. And um, you can say hello to all three storytellers on your way out and grab a Back Fence PDX button. Um, our next show is on April 5th and 6th, so I hope you will come and join us again. Have a great morning, you guys. Thanks again. <laughs>